Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu, and this is the April 2022 episode of Amplify. Today, we are interviewing Dr. Andy Hogan, one of three authors for the Emergency Medicine Practice article on meningitis and encephalitis. And as usual, before we get to that discussion, I'm going to remind you of a few important things. First, the Clinical Decision-Making in Emergency Medicine Conference is once again being held this year in Ponte Vedra, Florida on June 22nd through the 26th, and we look forward to seeing you there. You can get all the details about the conference at clinicaldecisionmaking.com. Second, if you haven't been to the website to check out the free open access medical education information that's there, I highly recommend you do so, ebmedicine.net, and click on the Foam Ed button. Third, if you haven't already rated this podcast, we'd really appreciate you doing so. If you enjoy the program and like listening every month, leave us some positive feedback. And certainly, if you have suggestions or recommendations, ebmedicine.net and click the contact button. And lastly, if you're not a subscriber, emergency medicine practice and pediatric emergency medicine practice articles that come out every month jam-packed with tons of information and all the CME you need for your practice, today's the day. Go to ebmedicine.net and subscribe. And without any further ado, let's talk with Dr. Andy Hogan. Hello, I'm Andy Hogan. I am an assistant professor of emergency medicine at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. And I am in the division of EMS at our institution. So I also do some pre-hospital medicine as well. Thank you for joining us today, Andy. You are also the author of the April 2022 article in Emergency Medicine Practice, which is on the topic of infectious meningitis and encephalitis management in the emergency department something that is very critical to our practice and something that we're going to spend some time discussing today because there are some very helpful tools in this article that we want to discuss. Let's start at the very top with a discussion about why meningitis and encephalitis. Was there something specific that pulled you to author this article or uh, a specific case or is this something that you have a specific interest in? I like to look at any sort of writing opportunity as uh, a way to also bolster my own knowledge on the topic. So taking a deep dive into the literature and really put, pulling together an evidence-based review like this really uh, helps me become a mini expert on the subject. And so that was certainly a, a draw for me as well. I think we see a lot of patients in the emergency department with undifferentiated altered mental status and often think, oh, could this be meningitis encephalitis? Uh, you know, I don't think so. I don't think they need an LP right at this moment. And then often we find an alternative cause, but having a little bit better tool set to recognize the situations where, hey, this really could be uh, an infectious etiology of this altered mental status, and we need to act fast to get that diagnosis and, and initiate treatment given the outcomes, the impact on outcomes of uh, timely treatment. Before we dive too deep into this, there is uh, a little nomenclature we need to explain. So if you're listening, we're discussing two disease processes, meningitis and encephalitis. Andy, tell us a little bit more about the difference between those two things. Yeah, so the difference is, is very much anatomical, and there's some clinical uh, findings as well that go along with meningitis versus encephalitis. So meningitis very specifically refers to inflammation of the meninges. You know, there can be non-infectious causes, but uh, often those that are jumping to the front of our mind are the infectious causes in someone who's got a fever, et cetera. And so encephalitis goes back to that, I believe, Greek root encephalon, meaning the brain, and that refers more specifically to inflammation of the brain tissue itself. Now, there is a term that floats around called men meningoencephalitis, which refers to an overlapping syndrome of both of those things both inflammation and the meninges and the brain tissue itself. We don't really focus on it in our article as much because the, there's not uh, a lot of clinical utility in that distinction from the standpoint of an emergency physician, but know that it is a term that you may see in the literature. Great. Let's start with focusing on just the bacterial causes. So bacterial meningitis is common in the U.S., or, or what are the rates we have in our country? You know, over the last couple of decades, as you look through the literature and look at different observational studies that have come out, the rates have more or less slowly been declining in recent decades. But more, more recent estimates from the late 2010s uh, 
in developed countries such as the United States place that incidence at about 0.9 cases per 100,000 persons per year, specifically talking about bacterial etiologies. And when we talk about the United States versus, say, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, there is a incidence in the U.S. of 0.9 cases per 100,000, and then in sub-Saharan Africa, it can be significantly higher. Is it just simply access to antibiotics and treatment, or is it something related to, uh, say, our immunization program? Do they not have access to the same immunizations that we do, or is it something actually geographic? Do we know that answer? So I think it's a combination of a little bit of all of those things, you know, more limited access to healthcare, broad spectrum antibiotics, intensive care, et cetera, but also a little bit of the geographic factor as well. Individuals living in very geographically isolated communities, especially in close contact, have less ability to self-isolate, to leave the area. It's uh, in terms of higher rates, it's similar to what we saw with the Ebola outbreaks over the last decade or so. Again, the geographical factors in isolation certainly play in. Now, there have been some pretty successful vaccination campaigns in Sub-Saharan Africa against certain pathogens, most notably men meningococcus, but kind of a combination of all those factors leads to these higher rates cited in the developing world. And when we talk about some of the notable causes for bacterial meningitis, there's an excellent table. If you're listening and have access to the article, it is on page three, the common causes for acute bacterial meningitis. Here in the U.S., what were common pathogens, Neisseria, H. flu, are really not the top two that we see anymore. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so by, by far and away, strep pneumo is your number one cause really worldwide. And traditionally, Haemophilus influenza and Neisseria meningitidis have been the number two and number three causes kind of vying for second place. However, as many of us know, Haemophilus influenza in the developed world has been the target of very successful childhood vaccination in immunization campaigns. And more recently, over the last couple of decades, uh, Neisseria meningitidis has also um, been targeted with a vaccine and there's been a decrease in the prevalence of these cases as a result. However, while there are vaccines against streptococcus pneumonia, a phenomenon known as serotype replacement has occurred. And really what that means as a non-immunologist, non-virologist, is that the strains that were targeted by the vaccine decrease in incidence and prevalence. However, other strains that were not typically as prevalent in causing disease have risen to fill that void. And for whatever reason, this has not occurred with Neisseria and Haemophilus, but is a big problem with strep pneumo. Yeah, that's interesting. That's something we see quite a bit on the viral side when we talk about immunizations and serotypes and variants. And as we treat one, the other increases. We've all had our immunology education exceed what we even wanted in the last three years, I think, with COVID. So that's a, a good introduction that this can actually occur on the bacterial side as well, although we're accustomed to discussing it in viruses. And speaking of viruses, they're equally capable of causing encephalitis and meningitis. When we talk about viral meningitis, how common is that in comparison to, say, bacterial infection. So viral meningitis is going to be much more common. And similarly to the common cold and, and other, you know, acute gastroenteritis infections we're very used to seeing very frequently in the emergency department, we don't always have a, a causative pathogen. A lot of times it's a clinical diagnosis as well. But in general, it's probably about 10 times as common as acute bacterial meningitis. You know, rates of 8 to 10 cases per 100,000 persons are uh, some of the better estimates that are reported in the literature. And the overall prognosis for viral meningitis generally much better than that of bacterial meningitis. Is that true? Exactly. You know, I, I kind of think of it similarly to any other viral infection we see in the emergency department. Many patients will look fairly well, have bothersome symptoms, but ultimately will will do well without really any anything other than supportive treatment. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there will, there will definitely be patients who may not have a bacterial cause of their illness, but will need extensive supportive care, admission, and the viral infection may exacerbate their chronic medical problems and lead to a snowball situation. So generally the prognosis is better, but I don't want to mislead anyone by saying that there won't be very severe cases.
And similarly, on page four of the article, uh, table two lists the numerous viral causes for uh, viral meningitis, and there are quite a number of them. So things to keep in mind, most of these, of course, we can't test for in the emergency department at the point of care. Uh, perhaps they'll show up on PCR or viral cultures at some point down the line, but not really pertinent to the acute care in the emergency department. And there's a distinction between viral meningitis and viral encephalitis. Those two disease processes look very different when it comes to prognosis and treatment. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the difference here comes from the fact that encephalitis, again, refers to inflammation of that and infection of that brain tissue itself. So in terms of symptoms, you're in clinical findings, you're going to end up with more ICU level criteria, such as patients with seizures, which are, may be potentially difficult to control, focal neurological deficits, impaired consciousness, which possibly requires airway management. Whereas when you have inflammation of the meninges, it can certainly lead to very bothersome symptoms, headaches, nausea, malaise, but not necessarily those symptoms and signs that result from that inflamed, infected parenchymal tissue. Yeah, and interestingly, the mortality rate is quite a bit higher. When we talk about viral meningitis, we think of more of the benign kind of self-limited process that's going to just be bothersome. But in the article, it specifically says if you have something like herpes simplex encephalitis, the mortality can be as high as 70%, which is really an astounding number, especially here in the U.S. when we think about infections and mortality. That's really on the higher end of the spectrum for just about any disease process. It's quite alarming. Yeah, I, I do want to uh, make a mention about the, the herpes simplex uh, encephalitis. That 70% figure really skews toward the days prior to the advent of effective antiviral therapies. So patients in, in the developed world with access to rapid, high-quality clinical care in the emergency department and in the ICU have a much lower mortality. However, this is certainly an infection that untreated is going to lead to a very high mortality, especially if unrecognized uh, and untreated. Good. That's a helpful distinction. In the current state of the pandemic, we talk a lot about COVID, which is also capable of causing central nervous system infections. How often does that occur? Do we have data for that? Does, does it actually cause meningitis or an encephalitis kind of picture? Do we know those answers? So, you know, I think that during the pandemic, we've seen numerous case reports and anecdotal findings, whether in a scientific journal or on social media of, wow, did you know COVID can cause this? I think of the, the COVID toes as something that I'm still a little bit skeptical as actually caused by COVID. But with anything, anything new and exciting, or I guess infamous is probably a better term. We're always looking for new things we can attribute uh, to that disease. But ultimately, from the standpoint of CNS infections, COVID behaves a lot like many other viruses in that it can cause the full spectrum of syndromes, whether a gastroenteritis, a bronchitis. And we're all very familiar with the very severe bronchitis or viral pneumonia with, with hypoxia. But, um, but yes, COVID can cause a viral meningitis or a viral encephalitis. Thankful, while there are numerous case reports of both of these clinical syndromes, it is not especially common. And generally, experts aren't recognizing COVID as, as a major cause of these syndromes. You know, I think take X number of patients with uh, a COVID infection, a very, very small percentage of those uh, are going to present with CNS infection type syndrome. And then really no conversation about meningitis and encephalitis would be complete if we didn't at least touch on fungal infections. Now, thankfully, in the predominance of patients we see, this is going to be a rare occurrence, but this is primarily a disease of the immunocompromised. Is that correct? That's correct. I don't want to say almost exclusively, but I think the take-home point in my mind for emergency physicians and other emergency providers is to consider this etiology in your immunocompromised patients who come in with a syndrome of meningitis or encephalitis. You know, I think statistics goes out the window when you have the patient that fits that, that clinical picture in front of you, even if it is a rare disease. So making sure to consider the etiology in your immunocompromised patients, your HIV patients who are not on antiviral therapy, your patients who are getting a hefty load of uh, chemotherapy every week and right at the nadir of their immune status. So ultimately, yes, uh, etiology to primarily consider in your immunocompromised compromised patients. Yeah, it's 
interesting when we think about these kinds of infections with patients who are infected with HIV or have AIDS or have organ transplants, but there is an increasing number of patients who are in the chronic phase of their cancer treatment and not necessarily even in the acute phase of cancer treatment. You know, they go get their infusions once a month and are equally, unfortunately, susceptible to these kinds of infections when, as you said, they hit that nadir and their white blood cell count is non-existent. So if you work somewhere near a cancer center or have one attached to your hospital, you probably are seeing this population of patients as well. So definitely an important thing to keep in our differential. When we talk about the evaluation for any process, we're kind of approaching it as the pre-hospital care and then the ED treatment. When it comes to our pre-hospital colleagues who may be listening, is there something important from the EMS side that they should know when it comes to these kinds of infections? Well, this is a topic I definitely want to, to spend a little bit of time on as a pre-hospital physician myself. But yeah, so in general, these are not, not necessarily exceedingly rare diagnoses, but a little bit more uncommon for our pre-hospital colleagues in terms of the, the typical calls that you know, paramedics are responding to, you know, shortness of breath, chest pain. Those kind of complaints are going to be much more common than uh, headache with fever and the exact clinical syndrome that's going to spell out meningitis or encephalitis. But certainly for the street-level EMS provider, something to be aware of and recognize uh, that this could potentially be an infectious etiology, make, make sure to utilize appropriate PPE. And from the standpoint of the emergency physician who's receiving patients from the pre-hospital setting, making sure to have good closed loop uh, feedback to those pre-hospital providers if there is potentially an exposure to an infectious agent against which those pre-hospital providers are not immunized or might benefit from prophylaxis. And when you're speaking to the paramedics or trying to figure out how, as the first responder, they're going to determine, should I be donning that PPE now before I even see this person? Are you teaching them or telling them, hey, if the call is for headache and fever or altered mental status and you get there and the patient has a fever, stop what you're doing and go make sure you have the PPE on? Or it's a little more difficult for them, right? Because they don't have any information really going into this scenario. Yeah, so I think for the majority of these cases, a mask and gloves is probably adequate. I think our, our pre-hospital professionals are, are very used to masking and in wearing gloves in the kind of in light of the ongoing COVID pandemic. In terms of adding additional layers of PPE, I don't know that it's 100% reasonable to, to ask our paramedics who are out in the 105 degree heat in the summer to put a very non-breathable gown on over their typical workwear to assess every patient who has a fever or reports a fever, but I think it's very important for everyone to understand that, recognize the signs and symptoms of a possible meningitis encephalitis syndrome, take those at least basic precautions, and recognize that they may be dealing with an individual with a communicable disease that they are at risk for, or other people in their household may be at risk for. And on the ED side, for our receiving physicians and other ED staff, I think it's important to have good feedback to our EMS agencies to let them know when a potential exposure has occurred after an infectious agent is identified in the patient received by that facility so that those EMS providers can get any necessary chemoprophylaxis. So specifically, they're looking for things that might be suspicious in the history, but pretty much the same things we would be looking for in the ED, right? Things like uh, headache, neck pain, fever, altered mental status, maybe even in an exposure in a family member or something of that sort that might say, hey, this is not your typical septic patient, or this is not your typical bacterial infection. There's something else going on here. And that can be relayed in advance to the hospital and hopefully then noted specifically which unit it was that brought them in so that when an organism is identified and post-exposure prophylaxis is necessary, that information gets back to the agency and those medics are then receiving prophylaxis. In the article, it actually mentioned EMS administering antibiotics in some areas. Is that common here in the U.S.? I, I wouldn't say it's common. I'd, I'd hate to, to cite such a trite saying, but there's the classic saying, once you've seen one EMS system, you've seen one EMS system. So I would say this is certainly something that's happening in some places. Whether it's widespread, I uh, would think the answer to that is no. 
However, there are some systems that have begun implementing sepsis alerts such that uh, patients who have multiple serous criteria or meet other system-specific guidelines are preferentially routing patients to certain facilities that may be more prepared to deal with very critically ill patients or may be able to stage antibiotics to be administered very rapidly on arrival to the ED. And to a more limited extent, there are certainly EMS agencies that are carrying antibiotics, something maybe like ceftriaxone that's somewhat broad spectrum and easily administered as an IV push. Whether that's widespread, I would say no. And while I have my personal feelings on uh, whether everyone that meets service criteria in the field should be getting antibiotics, some medical directors may feel differently. But if that if someone is working in a system that does administer antibiotics pre-hospitally, I think it's important to make sure that information is conveyed to the emergency provider once the patient arrives at the ED, because that does start the clock ticking on how sensitive your CSF studies are going to be if the patient's already received antibiotics before arrival. And that's actually a very good transition into our ED history. So if the patient arrives, perhaps we get some of this information from our EMS colleagues in advance, and we know that there is a concern. Is there something helpful? What kind of things are we looking to pull from the patient or family members when it comes to the history that might lead us down the meningitis encephalitis path? So starting more specifically with meningitis, there's no smoking gun that is 100% sensitive to clinically diagnose meningitis without, uh, without further workup. However, there is a, quote, classic triad uh, of that's cited decades and back decades and decades ago, uh, and that triad is fever, neck stiffness, and altered mental status. However, that, that triad in itself is not adequately sensitive to say this patient definitely has meningitis, and then furthermore will not help differentiate between bacterial or viral causes, uh, which have very different treatments. So that classic triad is really only about 44 to 66 percent sensitive in, in newer case series. When you add headache to that triad and a patient has two out of four of those symptoms, again, to kind of run through them, fever, neck stiffness, altered mental status, and headache, two of those four symptoms is about 95% sensitive for meningitis. However, that doesn't really speak to the specificity of those findings. But on the flip side of this, if a patient has zero of those four symptoms, you have effectively ruled out an infectious meningitis. Good. And then when we're discussing past medical history, and as we mentioned, if they have some history of immunosuppression, HIV, malignancy, ongoing chemotherapy, organ transplant, all those things become more relevant. What about URIs, upper respiratory infections, ear, nose, and throat infections? Are those still risk factors for these kinds of infections? Certainly. Again, viral meningitis falls on that spectrum of the variety of different conditions that you can get from the same seasonal rhino or enterovirus. But adjacent head and neck infections always have the potential, while I, I couldn't specifically cite you exact numbers, but always have the potential for uh, contiguous spread to the meninges and other things like recent head and neck surgeries, especially in immunocompromised or frequently hospitalized patients, should certainly spring to mind. And then Travel history is interesting. There was a period of time when we were worried about things like Ebola and hemorrhagic fever, that this particular question entered the triage protocol for nursing. And in some hospitals, it may not be in there anymore. So actually asking, hey, have you been out of the country or in the setting of people coming from other countries? Have you taken in a refugee or adopted a child or uh, had reason to leave the country recently, travel exposure still matters. Is that right? So certainly, depending on where an individual has traveled around the world, they may have been exposed to any number of emerging viruses or well-documented viruses, such as the Japanese encephalitis virus, for those traveling to East and Southeast Asia, that are well-known causes of infectious meningitis encephalitis. So it, it's really going to vary regionally what specific viruses or other organisms that an individual may have been exposed to. And then there's always insect envenomations, tick bites, all those kinds of things, which, again, we're not necessarily accustomed to asking, but in the setting of someone who is altered with a fever, perhaps a family member can share some of that history. Those are also risk factors. When we talk about the physical exam, 
There is what you learn in the textbook as the classic presentation for bacterial meningitis. But as we've seen here lately in the last couple of decades, some of those things that come out of textbooks from the 1950s may not be as specific or sensitive as we once thought in the era of more advanced testing. What is helpful on the physical exam to guide us down this path? So we have our two classic signs, the Koenig and Brzezinski signs that have the very specific maneuvers used to elicit them that have been described as far back as the late 1800s. These signs over time in subsequent case series have been shown to be really less sensitive and less sensitive than previously thought. Estimates of their sensitivity in newer case series are as low as 2% respectively. However, if these signs are present, the specificity is very high. But again, not sensitive and not especially reliable when they're absent. So a, a newer sign uh, described more recently is jolt accentuation of headaches. So again, many of these patients with meningitis and encephalitis are going to have a headache and gently rotating the patient's head back and forth at uh, a fairly fast rate, two to three rotations per second, has shown some decent sensitivity in the range of 60 to 65% for meningitis. And that is more specifically to say that when the head is rotated back and forth by the examiner, the headache worsens. That's very helpful. I have to put that in my back pocket. Rotating the head back and forth two to three times a second, hopefully without injuring their neck may worsen their headache, and that will point me in the right direction. Then when we move on to diagnostics, of course, there's always the lumbar puncture, and that's the standard for how we're going to diagnose most of these infections. When we talk about how much fluid we need to collect before it was just I'm getting a cell count and a differential, and then maybe I'm adding a gram stain, and now in the era of PCR testing, we need more and more fluid for each of these individual tests and screens. How much is actually safe to take out of a patient, an adult patient? So in the literature, it's reported that taking up to 15 and some maybe up to 20 cc's of, of CSF during a lumbar puncture can generally be done safely, which I think is probably a much larger volume than most of us that practice in the emergency department are used to taking. And after that uh, lumbar patient, puncture that takes frustratingly long to actually enter the uh, subarachnoid space and then flows very slowly, that may seem like uh, an excessive amount that may really prolong the time it takes to complete the procedure. However, again, as you stated, the larger volume we can collect within that that safety margin of you know, 15 to 20 cc's is going to is going to provide us a larger supply to run additional tests as needed. So, of course, that 15 to 20 cc's would be divided between your traditional four tubes rather than in each tube. But, again, a larger amount of CSF is going to give you some backup lab sample for additional tests that you may not have thought of in your initial wave of testing. And if we're collecting four tubes, some institutions in the order set are automatically performing the cell count on tubes one and four. Some are not, but we'll do it at request. Is that helpful when it comes to this disease? Certainly. So we don't really touch on it much in our review, but traditionally a decrease, a substantial decrease in your red blood cell count between tubes one and four is thought to be more indicative of uh, a traumatic tap, potentially penetrating a surface vein and contaminating your sample with blood from a superficial vein versus a more consistent level of elevated RBCs in your CSF, which is more suggestive of bleeding into the subarachnoid space, which may suggest an alternative etiology of your patient's symptoms, like a subarachnoid bleed. And then opening pressure, again, something that may not be performed routinely for patients where you're trying to exclude meningitis or encephalitis. Is that helpful in these disease processes? Yes, yeah, so opening pressure can certainly be another data point that might point you in the direction of uh, a viral versus a bacterial etiology. Typically, in viral meningitis, you're going to have a normal opening pressure, and that is a pressure less than 20 uh, centimeters of H2O. However, in bacterial meningitis, while it is not especially sensitive, an opening pressure elevated above 40 centimeters of water is more suggestive of a bacterial etiology. Granted, this is not the be-all, end-all, so if the only way you can successfully obtain a lumbar puncture is in a patient who is upright uh, rather than in the decubitus position, it is not the be-all, end-all of diagnosis. But it is one more data point that might assist you.
And then when the CNS fluid analysis is being performed and we're getting our cell counts back, there is usually some kind of neutrophil predominance, a left shift, an elevated CSF white blood cell count, but this isn't necessarily 100% of our meningitis and encephalitis cases. In the article, it specifically says up to 6% of patients who have culture-proven acute bacterial meningitis did not have elevated white blood cell counts, which is a little bit alarming to me, actually. It's one of the things that I heavily rely on when trying to make the diagnosis, but maybe suggest that, again, if the clinical syndrome fits and the initial CSF study doesn't, that there is still a possibility bacterial meningitis is the etiology. Is that right? Yes. So one of the things that really struck me while um, reviewing the literature behind this review uh, was that there's really no one element of your examination or your workup that's going to definitively in a very short amount of time say, yes, this is viral meningitis, yes, this is bacterial meningitis, or yes, this is a specific etiology of encephalitis. It's really about rounding out a, a good clinical picture with a lot of different elements of the exam history and workup. So even the CSF studies, which are the linchpin of diagnosis of these conditions, may be misleading in a small number of cases. And it's really about um, building a good clinical picture to support your decision making. And when in doubt, um, in my mind, potentially admitting that patient that you're very concerned may appear to be a bacterial meningitis, even with a more reassuring or more equivocal CSF profile. Yeah, for sure. There's a number of diagnostic studies listed here uh, for the CSF analysis after the cell counts, uh, including things like fluid protein levels, CSF and serum glucose levels, gram stain and culture. CSF lactate level was one of the ones listed, and that's actually not in the order set at my facility, but perhaps needs to be. Tell me about the utility of that particular test as well. Yeah, so I think uh, CSF lactate is probably not standard at most facilities. I know it's also not in the order set at any of the hospitals I personally work at as well. But uh, there is some literature over the last decade or so that show pretty good sensitivity at certain cut points for CSF lactate in differentiating specifically between bacterial etiologies of meningitis versus viral etiologies. Specifically, the cut point that has been reported in more recent studies is CSF lactate above 35.1 milligrams per deciliter shows a sensitivity of 93% and a specificity of 97% for a bacterial meningitis versus a viral meningitis. And that is specifically when it is obtained prior to administration of antibiotics, but it is a, a promising analyte and often can be run on the same analyzers that serum lactate is run on as well. However, I think a lot of us can envision logistical challenges if there is not a process in place at our institution to obtain that reading. It may require close communication with the lab or potentially creation of a new pathway, new order sets, et cetera. Yeah, I think I'm definitely in favor of the new pathway and improvement in the order set. If you're going to start adding this to your tests for CSF, especially with CSF, a fluid that you're not going to be able to go and recollect very easily, that a, a very formal pathway for how to handle that specimen and report it in the lab is very, very important. The units here, the lactate level greater than 35 milligrams per deciliter, this is the same units for serum lactate. So where we might get excited about someone with a serum lactate above four, this is a true CSF lactate greater than 35. That seems pretty extremely high. Yeah, this is also a situation where the cut point may limit your clinical utility. So while the sensitivity may be pretty high above a cut point of 35.1 milligrams per deciliter. If most of your samples are falling below that, the analyte may not be as clinically useful. It's going to kind of be case dependent. You know, if you raise your cut point high enough, you'll have a sensitivity and specificity of 100%, but the clinical utility may suffer as well. And it's interesting to see that CSF lactate levels can be high as well in patients who've had seizures or who have CNS ischemia from a stroke or even have CNS hemorrhage. So well, it's a test we're not accustomed to obtaining. So it seems like it might be exceedingly helpful in this particular disease entity, but by virtue of the fact that we don't obtain it very often, it's helpful to know that it is also elevated in those multiple other diseases.
So just one more tool in the toolbox when we're examining CSF. And then, of course, some of our hospitals are using some of the new nucleic acid amplification or PCR testing for specific viruses, even some specific bacterial proteins. So you may have access to these and get answers much more rapidly than a traditional CSF fluid culture when it comes to someone who might have an infection. The process of evaluating somebody in the emergency department outside of the lumbar puncture also includes some serum labs. Typically, we're getting a bunch of labs, but are there any specific serum markers that are helpful when we're trying to differentiate this disease process from something else? The reality is that no serum tests or really even blood cultures are going to, uh, again, be a smoking gun in terms of diagnosing these CNS infections. If you have a patient who potentially has bacterial sepsis and a sky-high white blood cell count, that may reinforce your clinical suspicion, but it probably is not making or breaking your management compared to your clinical exam and your CSF studies. Again, these are all tools that may be potentially helpful, but nothing that you would necessarily hang your hat on. And from that same point, I'm talking about your CBC, your C-reactive protein, and other studies along those lines. I do want to take a moment to just talk about serum procalcitonin, and I want to be very specific and say this is serum procalcitonin, not CSF procalcitonin, now that we've spent a little bit of time talking about CSF lactate. But an elevated serum procalcitonin, again, above concentrations in the 0.25 to 0.5 nanograms per milliliter range, generally have pretty high sensitivity and specificity for uh, bacterial etiology compared to viral etiology. But again, uh, not necessarily an easily accessible or readily available test at every emergency department. Good. So that's another helpful tool when trying to differentiate those two disease processes because that becomes relevant to disposition in someone who's, say, well-appearing. You know, do they have a viral process or a bacterial one? And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But first, let's get to imaging. So the question always when it we're debating whether or not to image someone is, is it necessary to get this person a stat CT scan of the brain before I do my lumbar puncture? Because clinically, I suspect that they have some kind of CNS infection. And back in the era of, I don't know, 20 years ago, it was, yes, everyone gets a stat CT head, roll them through the machine, and then stick an LP because they might have some kind of space-occupying lesion or increased intracranial pressure, and an LP might be contraindicated in that kind of setting. But is there newer evidence that can maybe help differentiate who needs a CT before an LP? Yes. So as, as you mentioned, a major concern in these patients is identifying an intracranial lesion that may be a contraindication to LP, with LP being the linchpin of diagnosis for meningitis and encephalitis. So there are a variety of society guidelines from institutions such as the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the United Kingdom Joint Specialist Societies, and the European Society for Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases that have published guidelines over the last 15 to 20 years with the clinical findings that would suggest the need for uh, head CT before LP, again, to identify those potential contraindications. And there are some consistent themes throughout these criteria. When you have focal neurological deficits, while that may be suggestive of encephalitis, that could also be resulting from something like a mass-occupying lesion that could lead potentially lead to a higher risk of herniation after LP. Now, there are multiple recommendations and guidelines published. There's four of them here actually listed in Table 5 on page 9 of the article from multiple societies. And these are patients who, based on their examination, might need a stat CT of the brain before you perform the lumbar puncture. But there is still a population of patients who don't meet any of these criteria who still have something to show up on a CT scan of the brain. Is that right? Yes. And on that same note, there are individuals who have a, quote, normal CT of the brain that after lumbar puncture do experience herniation. So while these rules are generally pretty good guidelines to suggest patients who are at higher risk, there's still a non-zero risk that a patient with a seemingly normal head CT may have a bad outcome after lumbar puncture. It's really hard to say whether uh, cerebral herniation, for example, occurred as a result of the lumbar puncture or simply as a result of the disease process as well. And this is a 
a small percentage, right? In the article, it looks like 0.1% uh, of patients who deteriorated did so within an hour of the lumbar puncture. And so there might have been some causality there, but it's a relatively rare thing, thankfully. And we're not doing this lumbar puncture in absentia, right? There is a patient here who has some pretty severe clinical findings and a disease process that is very important to accurately diagnose. And that very same disease process can lead to this herniation. So just as you said, the procedure itself it may be temporarily related to the herniation, but not necessarily causally related there. So it's, a, it's an interesting debate, but it's helpful to see that there are now four organizations that have published guidelines with the Infectious Disease Society doing it in 2004, and then most recently, the European and UK societies publishing them in 2016. That's uh, at least a guide for who you might consider performing a CT scan on. And there seems to be some pretty strong agreement there that if they have focal neurologic deficits or severely reduced GCS that you might consider imaging them first. Papilledema is interesting. That shows up on, I think, two of these, but not all of them. And if you're uh, accustomed to performing a rapid bedside ultrasound on patients, that might be something you could pick up uh, with a quick ultrasound of the eye in a cooperative patient. So just one more reason to use your bedside ultrasound. You did talk about MRI imaging in the article, but really this is down the line. Uh, it's not expected that you're going to perform emergent MRI imaging on this patient before performing a lumbar puncture because most of us just don't have access to that diagnostic tool. So although there may be some findings that help distinguish subtypes of infection, that's not really something we need to do or are expected to do in the emergency department just because of a lack of availability of that tool. Is that right? Exactly. But I do think it's worth spending a brief moment on in these days of increased levels of patients boarding in the emergency department. And while at my, my current institution, once a patient's admitted, even if he or she is boarding in the emergency department, they're generally being managed by the admitting service remotely. However, results may start uh, appearing on your dashboard for an admitted patient while they're still geographically close to you. So uh, you may have an opportunity as the emergency clinician to follow up on those results uh, and help coordinate further care down the line if a patient does in fact seem to have a pattern on MRI that's highly suspicious for a specific subtype of encephalitis. And there may be a role for emergency physicians on patients who spend more extensive time in the emergency department for, for better or worse. That's an important item to mention, actually, especially now in the era of COVID, boarding is a huge problem. So yes, these patients certainly may be in the ED, and you may certainly be asked by uh, a nursing colleague to look at a, a test that's been marked as critical for an inpatient. So yes, definitely helpful to have. Especially since patients with encephalitis are generally fairly ill and headed to the ICU. Yeah, somewhere that's even more busy and has less space to accommodate patients these days. So when we talk about treatment, since now we have made the diagnosis, maybe had some imaging performed, but had the LP and made the diagnosis, the antibiotic treatment is guided by, or at least somewhat, by fluid analysis, but that fluid analysis takes some time. So it's not going to be immediately after the lumbar puncture. Is it safe to assume that antibiotic therapy is going to be tailored based on what the initial clinical impression is and then adjusted based on whatever comes back from the lumbar puncture? Most definitely. So for most comers, a third-generation cephalosporin, such as ceftriaxone or cefotaxime, in addition to vancomycin, is going to give you pretty good but broad-spectrum coverage against the most common etiologic agents. However, additional agents come into play when you have immunocompromised patients. So generally, patients with severe immunocompromise from HIV or AIDS, those receiving immunosuppressive therapies, or after organ transplantation would benefit from addition of a stronger agent against specifically Listeria, which is generally recommended to be ampicillin. And then that is also relevant for patients with relative immunocompromise, such as advanced age or pregnancy. And the, the cutoff for advanced age is a little bit different from our definition of elderly. I don't think many of us would consider a 50-year-old individual to be elderly. However, that age, 50 years old, is generally cut off where we start to think even healthy community-dwelling individuals are more at risk for listerial infection. 
And then if it's a viral etiology or we suspect it's viral based on some risk factors or even just presentation, we're adding acyclovir to that regimen in addition to all these antibiotics? More specifically in cases where you have clinical evidence of encephalitis for your routine viral meningitis, if there is concern that this could be a bacterial etiology while pending diagnosis, you're going to want to be treating with that empiric antibacterial regimen, even if later your laboratory evidence is highly suggestive of a viral cause and the patient rapidly improves. However, if you have signs of encephalitis, knowing that herpes simplex encephalitis is the predominant cause of this syndrome in the developed world, empiric administration of acyclovir, especially with its beneficial impact on patient mortality, is going to be indicated in your initial empiric treatment as well. Good. And then there is some evidence that steroids are helpful with our bacterial infections. Tell me more about that. Yes. So this is a very interesting point. Corticosteroids have actually shown a negative impact on mortality in patients who have meningitis due to listeria monocytogenes or cryptococcus neoformans. So it's a tough question. Generally, because your strep pneumo is the number one cause of bacterial meningitis, guidelines and experts recommend empiric administration. However, once one of those alternative causes in which it is not beneficial to administer corticosteroids is identified, that's the time to stop administration of corticosteroids. Good. That's actually a very helpful distinction. So since the majority of these cases of bacterial meningitis or strep pneumo, there is still a benefit, even if it's just to the one dose you're giving with your initial antibiotic while you're waiting for the analysis of the fluid. But if it turns out that they have one of these other infections like listeria or a cryptococcal infection, then discontinuation of the steroids is important because in those cases, it's not helpful, maybe even causes a little harm to some patients. So very important to keep in mind. There are some special populations that are discussed in the article, specifically people with autoimmune diseases or those lacking childhood vaccines or even those coming from healthcare facilities. Tell me more about these categories of patients and how we might alter our treatment for them. Yes. So patients with recent neurosurgical procedures or extensive hospital stays who may be at risk for MDR organisms or a wider spectrum of infectious agents, generally in these populations, guidelines recommend even broader coverage. So we're talking about uh, vancomycin to cover your gram positives in addition to a fourth or fifth generation cephalosporin or penicillin like cefepime or even a carbapenem. There are even some experts that are recommending such broad coverage in your general immunosuppressed populations, even if they are not uh, necessarily status post recent neurosurgical procedure. Guidelines haven't quite caught up to administering very wide spectrum antibiotics empirically for all immunocompromised patients. So say your patient with HIV AIDS that uh, has not been recently hospitalized, has not had a recent head trauma or neurosurgery, guidelines aren't necessarily recommending very, very broad spectrum for those patients yet. But definitely in your patients who have a higher risk of exposure to those MDR organisms, even broader spectrum coverage is indicated. And what about the, the adults who might be lacking in childhood immunizations or maybe even didn't get the, the strep pneumo vaccination or the meningococcal vaccination in their uh, adolescent years? Does that alter our treatment for them? No, I wouldn't think so because you'll still be covering those otherwise immunocompetent individuals uh, lacking those childhood vaccinations with um, your standard empiric treatment, your vancomycin plus your uh, third generation cephalosporin plus your ampicillin for listeria depending on their age. However, patients may be more susceptible to acquiring, say, meningococcal meningitis if they have not received that vaccine. And on the viral side, mumps is a not infrequent cause of viral meningitis. So individuals who have not received their MMR series at a young age may be more susceptible to contracting that cause of viral meningitis. Great point. Ultimately, when we've performed the diagnostic testing and perhaps even given a first dose of treatment and then the fluid analysis is lending itself to be something more viral in etiology and the patient is, say, well-appearing, just has a headache, or that's the reason why they came in, but they're otherwise clinically well-appearing. Is there a population that can be safely sent home 
even though we don't have a formal viral pathogen identified, we just clinically think this is a viral meningitis and not a bacterial meningitis. Uh, and how do we distinguish who falls into that population? So I think there certainly is a population that fall into that um, category. Now, having a very strong evidence base to support your decision is a little bit of a moving target. But in general, there's some very scant pediatric literature that can, to a certain extent, be extrapolated to adults that can help inform your clinical decision making. And I think I would preface this by ultimately saying any decision to discharge a patient with a meningitis syndrome is definitely got to be a well-informed shared decision-making situation. But those patients who appear to be very mildly ill, recover pretty substantially with supportive care in the emergency department, and have signs and symptoms and laboratory evidence strongly pointing toward a viral etiology, in addition to having good, a good support network in their home and a good mechanism to return for further care if they deteriorate, I think that population generally will do well if they are discharged with strong return precautions and you know, a responsible individual that can keep a close eye on them. However, anyone with a, a non-insignificant suspicion for a bacterial meningitis should be admitted, and definitely those patients with um, very severe symptoms or any sort of encephalitis syndrome would not fall into, the, into that category of patients who can be observed at home. Yeah, it's interesting. I recall treating a physician colleague once who had a classic picture for viral meningitis, you know, young, healthy male, fully immunized up through childhood, and even with a family that had recently gone through a little GI illness, presenting with, you know, headache and neck pain. And he walked in and said, yeah, I already know I'm going to need a lumbar puncture, to which I said, yeah, yes, you are. And his CSF fluid analysis showed something like 100 white blood cells. Everything else was normal. He had some IV fluids and some Toradol and felt better. And his serum labs were all normal. And I went in to have this conversation with him. And I said, well, you know, here's what we found. Your white blood cell count is uh, 150 in your CSF. And he just looked at me and he said, okay, so I guess I'm spending the next uh, 48 hours here on IV antibiotics until my culture results come back. And I said, well, I guess so. If that's what you want to do and that's what you expected to happen, then, you know, there is a small population who we can send home. You know, you, your risk factors are very low and you've already had a dose of antibiotics, but certainly nothing that's going to cover you for two or three days while we wait for cultures, he said, yeah, 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 I'm going to stay in the hospital. I said, okay, all right, then that's what we'll do. But that kind of scenario kind of replays in my head each time I see one of these patients is hey, you don't really have very much in the way of risk factors. Your labs are rather reassuring, except for this one that shows you have increased white blood cells in your CSF. You're healthy, you're well-appearing, you responded well to therapy. But that kind of patient should be the one that's most amenable to going home and following cultures at home in this kind of setting. Is that right? Exactly. And I, I think ultimately this has to be a decision that both you as the clinician and your patient are comfortable with. And in the example you provided from your colleague, at least one of the two parties was not comfortable with that decision. And that's okay. That's probably not the individual you send home. And again, even if you have a patient who feels better and wants to go home, but your clinical suspicion is still fairly high that they might have a more severe etiology, that's the patient you're really working on convincing to stay. Yeah, and I had this discussion once with someone which kind of bears repeating, but the post-exposure prophylaxis medication is not meant to treat bacterial meningitis. It's meant as a prophylaxis to prevent it, so it doesn't have adequate CNS coverage. Giving someone a dose of, say, ciprofloxacin for exposure to Neisseria is not adequate to treat meningitis. It's just meant to prevent them from getting it because it can treat it in other areas like mucous membranes and such. So taking someone who might have, say, like a viral meningitis and got a dose of rocephin and then sending them home on Cipro is not really providing them with any kind of CNS coverage or improving their clinical status if you think they have viral meningitis, they go home without any oral antibiotics because none of those things have shown to have adequate CNS penetration. Is that right? Right. I don't see a situation where you're sending home anyone that you believe needs any sort of treatment against a bacterial pathogen. You know, the standard of care is admission and IV antibiotics for those bacterial meningitides. 
Fantastic. If you do have access to the article, there is an excellent clinical pathway on page 17 that will walk you through the steps from presentation through potential imaging and performing the lumbar puncture and then suspicion and ultimate disposition. That's very helpful to have. Uh, there are numerous tables that we also mentioned in the discussion today, everything from criteria for imaging, criteria for disposition, multiple different kinds of bacterial and viral processes that can cause infections, antibiotic dosing chart. There's all kinds of things in this article. I highly recommend it. And there is also an excellent risk management section in the article, which addresses some of the things we mentioned here, things like, do I provide antibiotics while I'm waiting for the CSF fluid analysis, or they came from a nursing home, I think they just have a UTI, I didn't really think about meningitis. These are some excellent clinical scenarios that I think bear some examination. So if you have access to the article, that's page 16, another very, very helpful section of this publication. Andy, thank you so much for joining us and spending your valuable time educating us about meningitis and encephalitis. I really appreciate you, Dr. Brockman and Dr. Santa Maria, authoring the article for us and, and taking the time to discuss it with us. It's been very helpful. Oh, and it's been a, a pleasure uh, spending a little bit of time talking with you. And also, I just wanted to echo your mention of my co-authors. Certainly couldn't have put this together without them. But uh, again, it's been a pleasure being here. And uh, I think it's been a stimulating discussion. Hopefully readers and listeners will feel a little bit more confident after reading up on the topic. And that's a wrap for this month's Amplify episode. Thank you again for joining us. And don't forget the Clinical Decision Making in Emergency Medicine Conference, all of the free information at ebmedicine.net. Go today and become a subscriber. Rate the podcast if you enjoy it. And I will see all of you next month. Until then, be safe, everyone.